Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as personalized recommendations or fiduciary advice. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for any investment, accounting, legal, and tax advice or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey everyone, this is Brent Foster with Northbound Wealth Management. This is your weekly market insights on the Northbound Wealth Podcast. Here we go. We're going to review last week. Bond yields rise. Government shutdown looms. Check this out. Rising bond yields and government shutdown fears left stocks in mostly negative territory for the week. And by the way, we're starting off this week kind of negative. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 1.34%, while the S&P 500 slipped 74 basis points, or 0.74%. The NASDAQ Composite Index was flat at 0.06% for the week. MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, fell 1.95%. The Dow Jones closed at 33,507 and change. That's up 1.09% for the year. NASDAQ closed at 13,219. That's up 26.30% for the year. Uh, MSCI EF index closed at 2,024 and change. That's up 4.14% for the year. Uh, S&P 500 closed at 4,288. That's up 11.68% for the year. Most of the equity gains, um, these indexes have given back some of their gains for the year. Um, and that's understandable given the correction that we're in. Treasury notes, 10-year treasury, uh, 4.59%. That's up 71 basis points on the year. Um, By the way, uh, U.S. T-bills, three-month, six-month, nine-month, one-year, two-year, all above 5%. If you buy and hold those, hold them to maturity, you will realize the the net result of that, which is mostly positive. So that's a great cash alternative if you're holding short-duration notes. The key is looking at when to extend duration to lock in higher rates for longer than the Fed will hold them higher. So what I mean by that is the Fed, given that there may be a recession outlook for 2024, their words, not mine, um, they potentially could pause or they could, uh, they could begin to lower. And so that would imply that short duration Uh, notes and other types of notes that are uh, guaranteed by the government might decline in value. So it would be beneficial to lock those in over a longer period of time. And so it's called the duration trade that everybody's trying to play right now. So everybody's short. One of the most popular trades right now is the six-month T-bill paying over 5.5%. Uh, You're not going to get that at the bank and don't do CDs. I don't know. I guess that would be, I don't want to give unique advice. Here we go. So uh, stocks follow the bond market. The bond market drove stock prices for much of last week as investors fretted about rising bond yields. After beginning the week and with small gains, stocks resumed their September decline amid weak housing data and decline in consumer confidence. However, it was a jump in bond yields which sent the 10 year treasury to a near 15 year high, guys. 15 year high. That may have been. Uh, that may have most undermined investor sentiment. So the higher that goes, the worse off it is for usually the equity markets. After a failed attempt at a rebound midweek, stocks surged. Uh, stocks staged a Thursday rally on a pause in bond yield increases, a rally that extended into Friday morning on an encouraging core PCE price index report, which is the personal consumption expenditures index. It's the Fed's preferred inflation gauge measure. Okay. But the rally faded as traders fixated on a potential government shutdown. So there's mixed economic signals amid recent signs of a labor cooling, a hopeful sign for ending rate hikes. Last Thursday's initial jobless claims report showed a, only a slight increase of 204,000 jobs. That was the second lowest reading since January and below economists' expectations of 215,000. 
Continuing claims declined by 12,000. That same morning, the final estimate of second quarter GDP was released, indicating a 2.1% annualized growth rate in GDP, unchanged from previous estimates. However, beneath the headline number, consumer spending was cut to 0.8% rise from its earlier estimate of 1.7%, which is a worrisome revision since consumer spending is the engine of the U.S. economy. And I've talked about this on previous podcasts. Watch the consumer data. If they start pulling back, we're going to head into some troubling times. All right. So uh, Monday, Institute for Supply Chain Management, that's ISM Manufacturing Index, part of the key economic data that we tracked. Jolt survey went uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, on ADP employment report and the ISM Saracens Index. Thursday, jobless claims. Friday, employment situation report. Notable companies reporting earnings, Constellation Brands. Light week there, right? Um, Food for thought. Time is the only critic without ambition. Quoted by John Steinbeck, author of Grapes of Wrath, which has been banned in most schools. Crazy. All right, tax tip. Who can deduct car expenses on their tax returns? Here we go. Tax tip for the week. Can you deduct expenses such as gas depreciation and lease payments on your tax returns? If you're a business owner or self-employed individual, you may be able to, if you use your car for business and personal purposes, you'll want to base any deductions on the mileage used for business. There are two ways to calculate the car expenses you can deduct. The first method calculates and deducts expenses, including depreciation, lease payments, gas and oil, tires, repairs, and tune-ups, insurance, and registration fees. The second is to use the standard mileage rate, which is a rate calculated to represent gas and some of the above factors that I have already discussed. In 2023, the standard mileage rate is 65.5 cents per mile. Taxpayers who want to use a standard mileage rate for a car they own must use this method in the first year the vehicle is available for use in their business. And again, this information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. Tip adapted from iris.gov. All right, on to the next segment. Hey, everyone. This is Brent Foster. And here is your 2023 year-end financial checklist. Um, I love this. I posted this to the blog. And uh, so check it out at www.northboundwealth.com forward slash blog, and you'll see the latest release. Um, So check this out. It's time to think about your year end financial strategies. As we roll into fall in the fourth quarter, now is a good time to pause and reflect on proactive ways to set up your finances for 2024. That's the upcoming year. Economically speaking, we are now in a much different position than last year. Economic growth has been strong and inflation appears to be trending lower, but regardless of current and future financial conditions, there are several actions you may want to take to look at before we close out the year of 2023. So number one, consider making tax moves before year end. Year end is a good time to take a look at your tax situation have some situational awareness, and assess your current and future tax liabilities. Keep this in mind. The ideas that I'm going to cover are for informational purposes only and not a replacement for real life advice. Make sure you consult with a tax, legal, and accounting professional before making any year-end tax moves. Uh, If it would help, we would be happy to coordinate with your tax team to outline your overall financial strategy. Here are a few tax-related questions to consider at year end. Does it make sense to offset gains with losses? It's called tax loss harvesting, if you don't know. You may have losses from some investments in 2022. Does it make sense to sell some investments this year that have gains to offset some of those losses? Losses do not expire, so there is no rush in taking them. And remember that taxes are only one factor to consider when making investment-related decisions. Also keep in mind that each year, you can offset up to $3,000 of your ordinary income with investment losses. All right. Should you consider a Roth IRA conversion? I've talked to many clients about this. By rolling your retirement plan into a Roth IRA, 
you pay taxes up front, but you may not be taxed when you take withdrawals later in life. You'll be taxed at the amount of the rollover in the year that you do it, which can result in a larger than expected tax bill. To help manage that, some roll over a portion of their investments into a Roth annually instead of all at once. Roth conversions do not make sense for everyone, so understanding the pros and cons is essential before making any decisions. Also, tax rules are constantly changing and there is no guarantee that the tax landscape will remain the same in the years ahead because they always change, it seems, every couple of years. To qualify for the tax-free and penalty-free withdrawal of earnings, Roth IRA distributions must meet a five-year holding period requirement and and occur after age 59 and a half. Tax-free and penalty-free withdrawals can also be made under certain other circumstances, such as the owner's death. The original Roth IRA owner is not required to take minimum annual withdrawals. There's many benefits, but discussing pros and cons are very important. Do you have items of worth that you could donate to charity? Not all charitable donations must come from your checking account. Consider donating real estate, cars, and other items of notable value. In this way, you can help causes that are important to you while potentially receiving a tax consideration. Do you have green deductions? You may be able to take advantage of certain tax credits for making green purchases in 2023. If you have made eligible home improvements that increase your energy efficiency, you could claim a tax credit worth up to $1,200. A new electric vehicle may get you a credit of up to $7,500, provided you and the car meet certain requirements. Even used electronic vehicle buyers may be eligible for a federal tax credit. Number two, discuss estate strategies at year end. As you gather with family around the holidays, it may be a great opportunity to review your estate strategy. Estate and tax considerations often go hand in hand. Many times as we discuss year-end tax management, we also make estate-related decisions. Along with managing our client investment portfolios and retirement savings, assisting in creating an estate strategy is one of the most critical services that we provide. We can act as the quarterback for your estate team and help coordinate activities with your attorney, tax advisor, and other professionals. Number three, don't forget your health flexible spending account. If you have an FSA through your employer, remember the use it or lose it rule. You may be able to roll over up to $610, which does not count toward the following year's contribution limit, but only if your employer offers this choice. Some employers also provide up to two and a half extra months to spend the funds. Check with your FSA plan or HR department to verify. If you do not plan on seeing your doctor or dentist again, there are some products that may count toward your FSA. Sunscreen, baby bottles, contact solutions, hearing aids, and glasses are just a few that might qualify. Some online retailers have created website pages for FSA eligible products to help shoppers. However, be careful not to purchase too many of the same products as the IRS does not allow FSA funded stockpiling. Number four, what to do with required minimum distributions or RMDs. If you must take an RMD from a retirement account or from one you inherited, but do not need the money to cover the living expenses that you have, use year end to decide what to do with the assets. Remember the secure and secure 2.0 laws enacted over the past several years have changed some of the rules surrounding RMDs, including when they must begin in the treatment of inherited qualified assets. If you have any questions about what changed, we can provide some guidance or we may have some resources that can help. Number five, use your end to improve your financial situation and assess whether you're on track to pursue your goals. As financial professionals, we want to help our clients be well positioned for the coming year. If you're not currently working with a financial professional, we would welcome the opportunity to give you an assessment of what's ahead for 2024 and explain how we are positioning our clients for the new year and beyond. If you have any questions about year-end strategies or anything we covered, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at Northbound Wealth Management. You can reach us by calling us at 317-399-1107. 
317-399-1107 or by sending us an email at info at northboundwealth.com info at northboundwealth.com thank you and stay tuned for the next segment i wanted to share with you an excerpt from money possessions and eternity by randy alcorn chapter 11 the pilgrim mentality Tertullian said and so it is that when a man walks along a road the lighter he travels the happier he is Equally on this journey of life, a man is more blessed if he does not plant beneath a burden of riches. William Burns said, If a man have Christ in his heart, heaven before his eyes, and only as much of temporal blessing as is just needful to carry him safely through life, then palm and sorrow have little to shoot at. And Thomas A. Kempis wrote, Let temporal things serve your use but the eternal be the object of your desire. Randy Alcorn writes, a wealthy plantation owner invited John Wesley to his home. The two rode their horses all day, seeing if just a fraction of all the man owned. At the end of the day, the plantation owner proudly asked, well, Mr. Wesley, what do you think? After a moment's silence, Wesley replied, I think you're going to have a hard time leaving all this. All of us form attachments. All of us have a place we call home. The question is, do we think and live as if this world or the next world is our home? Are our minds on earth or heaven? The plantation owner was attached to the world he was in. Wesley was attached to the world he was going to. Perhaps you've heard it said, he's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. Yet scripture commands us to set our minds on heaven. It says, since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. When we're properly heavenly minded, we'll be of maximum heavenly and earthly good. But when we are too earthly minded, we will ultimately bring no good to heaven or earth, C.S. Lewis writes. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves who set foot on the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. Materialism would dupe us into believing this world is center stage, the destination rather than the road to the destination. From there, it is a short step to racing off to earn, collect, accumulate, take, and consume as if that's all there is to life. Then we wake up one day and realize how terribly unhappy we are or just as likely we never wake up at all. To escape the gravity of materialism, we desperately need to redirect our minds towards heaven. As usual, A.W. Tozer had something significant to say on the subject. It has been cited as a flaw in Christianity that it is more concerned with the world to come than the world that is now. And some timid souls have been fluttering about trying to defend the faith of Christ against the accusation as a mother hen defends her chicks from the hawk. Both the attack and the defense are wasted. No one who knows what the New Testament is about will worry over the charge that Christianity is otherworldly. Of course it is, and that is precisely where the power lies. Let no one apologize for the powerful emphasis Christianity lays upon the doctrine of the world to come. Right there lies its immense superiority to everything else within the whole sphere of human thought or experience. When Christ arose from death and ascended into heaven, he established forever the three important facts, namely that this world has been condemned to ultimate dissolution, that the human spirit persists beyond the grave, and that there is indeed a world to come. The church is constantly being tempted to accept this world as her home, and sometimes she has listened to the blandishments of those who would woo her away and use her for her own ends. 
But if she is wise, she will consider that she stands in the valley between mountain peaks of eternity past and eternity to come. The past is gone forever and the present is passing as swift as the shadow on the sundial of Azaz. Even if the earth should continue a million years, not one of us could stay to enjoy it. We do well to think of the long tomorrow. I love that excerpt. I think it's great. C.S. Lewis is being quoted, A.W. Tozer. Randy Alcorn's book's one of the best ones out there for those of you who believe and those who don't, who want to understand biblical principles of finance. It's a great one. It's a long read, but it's an excellent one. It's worth it. All right, on to the next segment. Breast cancer is a reality. Breast cancer is a reality for one in eight women in the U.S., making it the most common cancer among women worldwide, according to a 2023 report by the American Cancer Society. A woman is diagnosed with breast cancer in the U.S. every two minutes. As you read this, someone is hearing their results and starting their cancer journey. Breast cancer is the second leading cause of death for women, but there's hope on the horizon. Over the last decade, we've seen a 7% decrease in breast cancer mortality rates due to early detection and treatment advances. These are not just numbers. They represent our mothers, sisters, daughters, and friends. As leaders in the financial sector, we are uniquely positioned to contribute. We can make a difference by donating to organizations that fund critical research, support services and awareness campaigns, participating in fundraising events like charity runs, walks, or rides that raise funds for breast cancer research and care, or volunteering at local breast cancer clinics, organizations, or events. This month, don't just wear pink ribbons. Let's do more. Let's all do something. What plans do you have to support National Breast Cancer Awareness Month? Check us out at hashtag make a difference, support the fight, and hashtag northbound wealth management. If you have any questions about it, let us know. But we're all about supporting everyone out there that has breast cancer because most likely it's affected somebody in our families. So go out there and make a difference. Until next time, have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.